We're going to go in Luke 24, but first I want to show you something that's kind of a hidden little secret that we'll read tomorrow in our daily reading. If you're, today's a perfect time to start reading the Bible. It's, and you just, we have a Bible reading program that's, that uh, it's in the back, it's online, and I try to put an overview over it. It takes us five chapters. You just start today. doesn't matter what, what days have gone by. Start today and uh, grow the scripture because tomorrow is going to read what I want to read today in Luke, Leviticus 23. This is the listing of the seven feasts include, and, and, and the feast of the Sabbath, the rest, day of rest every week. We just went through Passover. We are in the midst of unleavened bread. We are, today is the celebration of the third feast, and it's a, it's a little feast that goes, goes by. It never had a calendar date, but now forever it has, because it was the feast of the first fruit. And the feast of the first fruit was because it was an uh, agricultural society. When you began to have the fruit show, like every year that's a little different, the first fruit, they would bring it before the priest, and he would then wave it as a wave offering. And that wave offering was to be received as the first fruit. Now, anybody got an idea who was the first fruit? Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. He was the first fruits. Why? Because then from that first fruit, you were to count 50 days, which took you to the Feast of Weeks, or what we know as Pentecost which was the beginning of the harvest season. Hallelujah. I mean, of course Jesus has to be raised on the first fruits, right? Because he is the first fruits of the new creation to whom we're all being conformed into his likeness. And then one day we're going to all be on the celebration of the Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the end of the harvest, the completion of the harvest. And that's the last of the seven feasts. So if we'll go to Luke, uh, Luke 24. I just want to thank the Lord for his father's willingness to give away out of a father's heart his only begotten son, who God the son had become son of man and came to be the sacrifice for sin and his willingness to do so. I am grateful that the son of man, Jesus, could submit himself to the father and trust and believe that God would raise him from the dead. Because that faith brought righteousness into the earth forever. And that faith is now offered to all of us to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. We're imputed righteousness. And I believe what Cammie said is really by the Spirit that there is a lot of places where death has tried to hold us to a place where it's almost paralyzed us. And God doesn't want that condition for us as his church. He wants us to step into the resurrection. The reason I want to study and meditate and grow the sound of resurrection is because it is the message of the, new, of the church in the book of Acts and in the chapter 3, beginning chapter 4, after the miracle at the gate beautiful, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the whole Sanhedrin were so infuriated because they were teaching the resurrection from the dead in Christ Jesus. There was, there was this whole transformation of the, of, of, of the mindset. And I, I think over years we can lose some of it, but I, I know God's ready to bring the full impact of resurrection and what resurrection from the dead means. Resurrection's an event, or an act, or a verb. It's not a state, it's, it's a verb. It starts from death, and he resurrects from death into life. We get to walk in the newness of life. But it's also something we are growing to attain to the resurrection from the dead. So there's areas in life that we could be dead in, and we're kind of going, gosh, I'm just kind of dead in my heart. I'm sad. I'm sorrowful. I feel like a victim. Life is not working. We get dead in lots of ways where we get kind of shut down. Literally, in the Greek, resurrection means to stand up again. Isn't that pretty cool? Just to stand up again. 
meaning that you, that you were alive, now you're dead, but now out of death you stand up again. And that's what Jesus did by the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't raise himself up. Father did it through the command of the Holy Spirit or sending the Holy Spirit. The power of God is the Holy Spirit's power to resurrect. So it's available. Whether we're sick or sad or sorry or angry, we can come out of there today. This is day that is available. So Luke 24, we read this again. This is our reading today for resurrection. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. The Lord kind of chuckled at me. He says, you're never going to get up early enough to find me out of the grave. You're never going to catch me on my resurrection. They were so early. And the other women, they came. They were bringing spices. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in, and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They had come to honor and to mourn and to give him appropriate anointing for burial, but they missed the chance. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. New International says they're like flashes of lightning. And then as they were afraid, they bowed their faces to the earth. They said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? That's a pretty good question to always ask. You know, he's not here. He's not here. He's not here. He is risen. Remember, now, this is the part of today that is even as we remember the resurrection, we will come back into places of understanding and where faith can come back alive and where the power of God will meet our faith to bring resurrection to us out of the place that we've got ourselves lost into. Because he said, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. There is no resurrection life. There is no resurrecting from the dead unless you have the place of death to resurrect from. And so some of us have gotten trapped in places, and we think that is the end of the story, the end of the story. No, it's the beginning of the story. It's the launch pad for the, for the life of God to be seen in us. He said they remembered his words. Every time Jesus, while he walked the earth, spoke of that he would have to suffer and die and be crucified, he always ended it, and I will be raised on the, last, on the third day. So they remembered his words. So then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. These women now are full of faith. They have been energized with an experience supernaturally and with words that they're remembering that Jesus spoke and they've come alive. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and other women who told these things to the apostles. Now, think about Cammie's word. That was Saturday. It's still Saturday for the apostles. They're sitting home, locked up in a room, afraid of what they're next. And it says that these words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. So here is this truth above all truths, the most important event in all mankind and all forever, the resurrection of the man Christ Jesus. It's why we want to, I want to understand this. Because I understand, I know there's so much more in that resurrection from the dead into the newness of life that he walks in that I can come into. I want to, I want to go there. But you can hear as much as you've heard and they're in the sadness and the sorrow and the fear they're in. They go, I can't, I can't go there. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. It's always good to consider and be open. Be open that maybe we don't yet know it all. Maybe there's more that we've yet to touch. Maybe there's more God's trying to say. We don't get it, so he's open. 
Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which is seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. You imagine their story. And it, so it was that while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Here's the good news, beloved. Every time Jesus, from the day he was raised from the dead, reveals himself to his disciples or anyone, nobody recognizes him at first. It's part of the way God draws you in to make a point and to impact, because that's why it says, and we're going to look at it for seven weeks, why he was showing himself alive by many infallible proofs, why he was revealing himself to his disciples. We can all be that in these next weeks where we can start having the resurrected, glorified Christ reveal himself to us. But we won't start knowing. We just start with the conversation. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this you have with one another and as you walk and are sad? <laughs> oh, you know, when, you, when you've come out of the dead, you pretty much have a, a smirk on your face because you came out of it, and now you can't go back there. He has an indestructible life. He has an indestructible life. It's impossible for him to die now. He became a mortal man. He was already given the sentence of death in the seed of David, the physical seed of the body meant he was a part of immortality. But he presented himself to the Father's sinless sacrifice so that, so that in through death he could destroy him who had the power of death. But now he can't die. And he said, if we believe, we can't die. And now we know that believers are falling asleep and we have to, there's a weight recognition, but there's also some power that I don't think we've yet started to see happen where, where life just starts to overtake death. Anyway, they're in a bad place. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas. Cleo, the one time every year your name is mentioned. Man, you were playing the bass today. Dear God, I don't know what happened to you. You were like rocking. You were. You. <laughs> I felt like I could start climbing up on those steps of those tones. Each one, I'd just start running up into heaven. It was glorious. Yeah. So Cleo's going, what are you? Are you the only stranger? Are you the only person I haven't heard? You know, didn't you, you know, have you not known the things that happened? And they said, well, what? He says, what things? And I want you to understand something. Your Jesus, my Lord, our Lord, is so confident in the resurrected life that he's come into, the, the zoe, the life-giving spirit, the Lord, the King, the Messiah, all that was appointed him upon his coronation. He is so secure in that that he would rather us start the conversation of honesty with our plight, our problem, our disappointment, our confusion. So he says, what's, tell me. See, it's a conversation. He is the logos, the conversation of God. Now we start gaining that. He goes, well, but the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And how are the chief priests and our rulers, they delivered him and condemned him to death and they crucified him. But we were hoping. See, every believer is going to have a loss of hope. Everyone who says yes to Jesus will have within the yes a dream. It comes alive in so many ways, but it will die in so many other ways. And you'll have a, a confrontation of, well, I saw it going this way and it went that way. Or what a, we, we, we saw him. He was, we were hoping he was going to redeem Israel. And besides all this, today's the third day since these things happened. And there were certain women of our company. They arrived at the tomb and they astonished us when they didn't find his body. They came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels and said he was alive. And certain of them, of those who were with us, they went to the tomb and found it just as the women 
had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus never had to try to explain beyond the word. He just had to point out within the word who he was. And he was always pointing to his apostles, his disciples. You guys, you're just, you're slow. You're slow, and you're, you got, and you're, you're foolish, and you're not ready. I... I I long, I long for Jesus to do that. Every time he converses with me to take me from my hope deferred, my disappointment, my brokenness, my victimization, he comes along and he says, oh, don't you get it? You haven't seen this, what was said. The prophets already prophesied it. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And since the Christ has suffered these things to enter into his glory, the things you and I have suffered through is to enter into his glory. And I'm here to say to you today, you don't have to keep suffering in the same place. You can enter into his glory. We can come into the glory that he's given us. But we have to let go of the death. Can't nurse it. We have to release it. So in the beginning, uh, at Moses... It's a seven-mile walk. <laughs> and all the prophets, he expounded to them or opened up alongside to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's why we're reading through the whole Bible. The whole Bible says, Jesus! And, and that life is there no matter what storyline we're in, what process of life we're in, the beginning of life, the end of life, the journey, the disappointment, the heartbreak. He's always speaking to bring us to him. So they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated he would have gone farther, but they constrained him and said, abide with us. It's toward evening. The day's far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat with, at the table with them that he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it. There's so much that happens in the blessing and the breaking of the bread, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened. And they knew him, and they vanished, and he vanished from their sight. You see, this is, the, this is this glorified Christ that he brings you to a point to see and know and recognize, and then he doesn't have to be there in the means in which he's coming because now you've been imprinted. Faith has come alive in you. And so they say to one another, did not our hearts burn? burning hearts. That's who we are called to be, the burning hearts. Hearts that are on fire. That when the word of God and the voice of the Lord, when we read the scripture, it just starts to create a warmth. And sometimes it turns into a fire. Did our hearts not burn while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us. When, he, when you read the scriptures, he starts talking. And he opens them up, and he starts to cause transformation. So they rose that very hour, and they returned to Jerusalem. They got walked seven miles in sadness, and they ran back seven miles in gladness. That's the resurrection story. <laughs> and that's our story. We get to have that story. But it's not, there's no, the victory is when you, is coming out of the death. All of us will go into death. One way or another, in some ways, more than others. But it's coming out of death. That's the story. That's the one that God wants us to share. Where the only thing you have left to prove that you were dead as you were dead is the scars. And the only reason you keep the scars is to prove that you were dead because you sure don't look dead now. You look alive. You look like you're full of joy. You look like you're not depressed and discouraged and sick and dying. All of a sudden, you're going... Whoa, I'm, I've got the life. See, because Ephesians says that God wants us to have our understanding enlightened so that we can know the exceeding greatness of his power into us who believe. That's working of his mighty dominion power that he in, energized in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead. That's power isn't supposed to be in us. That power is in us that we've received. 
And God does everything beyond what we can ask or think according to the power that's in us. Not our power. The power is not from us. It's in us, but not from us. So they're running, walking in sadness, running in gladness, walking in sadness, running in gladness. We're all going to have some sad days, bad days. But I love those glad days. You know, the sorrow and sighing flee away and joy and gladness become the redeemed song as you're getting on the highway of holiness and running back home. And any of us can do that, and many of us need to do that. I try to do it at least three times a day to run home, to run back into the arms of victory and triumph and joy and peace and, and get out of the confusion and chaos and what do I think and what's happened and how did this happen? I just... You know, they were in a sad state. They had no reason to be sad, but they were sad because they didn't have the truth of what had happened. Now they got the truth, and now their eyes are open, and now they're full of life, and they're running. And they come, and they say, the Lord, they hear the first thing, the 11 say, the Lord's risen indeed. He's appeared to Simon. And so they tell him about what happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And now, as they said these things, Jesus himself. You see, you get a couple of believers who are getting connected to the resurrection of Christ, who have had an encounter with this vital life, and they start talking. You can't help but next thing you know, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. <laughs> he himself stood in the midst of them and said, Peace to you. And they were terrified. And they're frightened. And suppose they'd seen a spirit. They're, they're, it takes a lot to reprogram the human soul and the function and the trauma and dramas. And anyway, he says, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your hearts? Behold my hands, my feet, and it's myself. Handle me. See, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. So they're touching him. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, and they still did not believe for joy. And they marveled. And he said to them, have you any food here? He's trying to prove this is me. I'm, I can't wait to get the resurrected body. You can eat when you want. It doesn't show up. You can leave through a door, or you can go through a wall. You just tell oh, it's what a body. Anyway, we're going to get one. But while they were still did not believe for joy and marvel, he said, any food? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke. You see, everything that happens to a believer will be that you'll hear it in the introduction in Revelation, but you're going to have to walk through the tribulation to get the manifestation. There is, there is tribulation, a kingdom, and patience in our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation attracts tribulation, a testing of our faith. And we're not to be frightened by the testing of our faith, but to just get a hold of patience with joy, because that's how we get complete. There is no com maturity in the church without tribulation of some sort that makes us question, am I hearing the truth? Is what God said to me so? How come if it, he said this to me, how come these, I interpret this, that? And it's a process, and it's a blessing. And so Jesus said, these are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you. He starts where the last conversation ended. But these are the things that must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. Our life is in the Bible. You may not find your name there like Cleo. But your life's in the Bible. Your name's in the Bible. You're in sight of Christ. Every one of us, before time began, we were given that place. So he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scripture. All of a sudden, dull, slow of heart, hard, porous heart started to go, wow. And then he said to them, and you'll say this one day. I've said it many times. I'm still learning to say it in some places. Thus it is written. Thus it was necessary 
for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Thus it was written. If it's been written, it's necessary. You cannot escape the scriptures or the journey in scripture God has appointed you to live in. But if you, it is written, then it's necessary. If there's suffering, then there's glory. And I want to say again to the beloved Bible-believing, reading church, it's time to go into the glory. It's time to not live in the suffering. Though we walk to the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. Your rod, your staff. We got to quit camping. We're not living. You say, well, I, I, I'm trying to get out of that valley. No, it's not about the valley. It's the rod. It's the staff. It's a little bit of correction from the Spirit of God and the Word of God. It's a little bit of nudging saying, get going, get up. And then about the time you're going, I want to rest. He says, nah, come over here. We're going to eat in front of your enemies. We're going to learn to feast while they're sulfur breath ready to take you down. You're going to learn to love and live in peace. I tell you, the hardest thing is to learn to live on the mountain of fear and just go, oh, fear is fear, but it isn't got any, it can't get near because he destroyed him who had power of death. That is the devil. So I don't have to be subject to the slavery of fear. So now I'm learning to live in peace, joy, love, righteousness with fear all around me but it's not in me. I'm feasting. So that's the first thing. You've got to feast. Now, if you're feasting, then how about your cup? Let's get it overflowing. Let's get it overflowing. Let's get joy flowing. Let's get peace flowing. Let's get victory flowing. We're the people that are going to change the world, not because of our ability, but because of what God did in his son that we're feasting on and drinking from. And he's maintaining it. And then, he, and then he, 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 just, he just says, goodness and mercy, I command you now to follow this one. That all comes after the valley of the shadow of death. So we're going home. You, want, you, you, know, you can invite, hey, mercy and you know, you know, goodness. I'd like you to follow me for the rest of my life. And I'm going to dwell in the house of God forever. I'm dwelling in the house of God. I'm not, I'm not falling away. Oh, whoa. That's our heritage. And it's possible because of Jesus, because he had to rise on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is no advancing in the kingdom without repentance. Because wherever we are is because where we are is where we are and because we think the way we think. And if God wants to move me from where I am and thinking the way I am, he's going to have to introduce thoughts that I don't think or remind me of things that I used to think that I forgot. That's repentance. And once a repentance comes, there can be a returning and a remitting and sins go away and their, their capacity to keep me and bind me and lock me up and tell me I can't get out of here, they just all go away. And he says, you're witnesses of these things. We are witnesses. We're going to look at, we're going to, we're going to go around and say, honey, what Jesus did for me, he can do for you. Amen. And we're going to know where we start evangelizing? His church. So many people caught up in so many struggles that don't need to be perpetuating. Maybe you're going to walk through the physical part of it for a while, but... We can walk through the valley of the shadow of death having a party. A party. Joy, peace, righteousness. And that's the sign that's going to be liberating. And a message of hope. A message of hope. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Beloved, there is coming a fresh endowment. Oh, there's coming a fresh endowment. Where? <laughs> we, saw, we started seeing it in the water baptism on Wednesday. I don't know if you caught it. Whoa. Whoa. It just took on the life of himself. Because, see, when the Spirit of God starts to make a point, he just takes over. But 
I think he often waits till we get he, the right point's going to be made. And the right point that's got to be made in these last days is Jesus, this glorified Messiah, King, Lord, who sits in heaven laughing. <laughs> He's triumphant. Everything that he is. And when he, that message is amplified by the Holy Spirit because his job is to make Jesus famous. So that's why he said, okay, guys, you, you stay here. We're going to do a crash course for the next 40 days. I'll be showing up whenever I feel like it. And I'll be in, making it clear to you that I am ra- uh, alive. I have been raised from the dead. And that this is indeed according to the scriptures. And we'll be doing a lot of scripture stuff. How do you think those disciples get up on Acts chapter 2 and they're quoting scripture? Man, because he was going, this is, this, let me show you here, let me show you here, let me show you here. Psalm 2, Psalm 110. Oh, there I am, there I am, there I am, there I am. Here's the purpose, here's why I'm here. This is all now possible. I paid for sin, I own sin. Sin has no authority, it's been remitted. Now we're ready to start what I came to do, which is to raise up a people, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a peculiar people who will show forth my praises. Oh, Sheila, we are gonna get so crazy, it's gonna be crazy. No more sad songs, sorrowful hearts. They're gonna flee away. I mean, there's seasons to be sad and sorrowful, but there's times to be happy and glad. You can't choose which one, but when it comes, you can't stop the one that's coming. It's like a tide. Tide's coming in. Tide's coming in. It's a ebbing, flowing tide. It was an ebbing tide. Now it's a flowing tide. So he led them as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And now as it came to pass that he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Beloved, you have things you need to bless and release blessing over. Families, futures, past sins, ministry points. Like Jacob who leaned on his staff at the end of his days and he blessed his 12 sons. He said, this where will go. And while he's blessing him, you're carried into heaven. And then they worshipped him, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. It's in 40 days. How many, how would like to have a 40-day transformation into great joy? I, I do. I do. I'm looking forward to it. I don't ever preach anything other than what I'm trying to find or what God's trying to find me in. I'm after things, and I know that through the message of the word, you find what God's trying to give you. You have a hung inkling. So they're in, continually in the temple. They're praising God, and they're blessing God. They're praising, and they're blessing God. Whew. Can we stand together? I just feel like there's a blessing right now ready. I want to give. I, want, I think there's a blessing Jesus wants to give. By now, I'm sure you've had a time to consider some of the journey, life's tr- struggles, troubles. If we can get the choir back up, I think the choir has got to take us to the future. It's ours in Christ. Mm. Where are you? Are you hidden? You're locked up, addicted to television, sad, mad? running away, refusing to be comforted. No one, no one can help. I, I don't know where you are. I know where I am. See, that's the intent of God is he says, I want to know where you are, Steve. You can go say, well, I'm not going to own me because it's not my fault that I'm here. It's Cammie's fault that I got in this state. <laughs> and, it, and since it's Cammie's fault, we don't need to talk to me. Go talk to her. Tell her to behave, and then I'll be a victorious Christian. <laughs> no, now you know that. You know God enough. If he ever has a conversation, it's about you. It's about me. He only talks to me about me. And he rarely, I mean, he doesn't even talk to me about Cammie. <laughs> but where are you? Where do you want to be? What hope did you have 
that you hope for, marriage, business, finances, just to be loved, someone to care for you? What hope did you have that didn't manifest, materialize or come forth? I don't know. But I do know that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And sorrow makes us to lose our vision. And, we, and troubles begin to weigh us down. And they begin to tell us who we are. And we begin to think that, well, I am going to always be here. I think I could have been something great, but something happened. I did something wrong. Someone did something really wrong to me. I, I don't know the story. Tell the Lord your story. Tell the Lord your story. And, and tell him before it grips you and as it's dismantling, because the power of God's coming. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Thus it is written, thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory. Thus it is written, thus it is necessary. The Bible is not escapable. The path in the scriptures is not alterable. The way into newness of life is through the cross. And that death for all is going to be more than we know what to do. So if you'll just, I don't know, I just want to bless you. If you tell the Lord, where are you? Lord, I'm discouraged, I'm sad, I'm excited, I'm anticipating. Maybe you've let, never move this out of the way. Maybe you haven't ever given Jesus your life. Maybe you're not sure if he's really the Lord. But today, something's tugging on your heart, saying, don't go home without saying, Jesus Christ, you're my Lord. Because this is a moment. There's never, there's always something. Let me ask you, have you? Everyone who's asked Jesus into their heart and he is their Lord, would you raise your hand for me? He is your Lord, your Savior. You've asked him in. Anyone who's desiring to know him in a new way again or a fresh way, would you raise your hand? A brand new way. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Bill, he just got you. <laughs> yeah, you want to know him in a new way, right? I want to know you in a new way. I want you to show up in my life in a new way like never before for the next season. So, Lord, I stand here to bless your living body. And as we worship, as we close, that you will indeed ignite the fire. The burning hearts would start to come together. Mm. I pray that the interpretation, the understanding of Scripture will come forth as like never before. We won't open the Bible without the Word starting to spill off the pages and speak life and encounters with the living Jesus. That the Spirit of God would come and is in a fresh new way. And forgiveness would be experienced. Amen. 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 Whoa.